And we're back to talk about some sponsors yeah. for this segment. Don't forget those. That are brought to you by Anapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at anapsis.com. And by Pony Express, check out the community edition and turn your Nexus 7 into a lean, mean, pen testing machine. For all those hard to reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at ponyexpress.com. And of course, by Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at Black Hills InfoSec to request a quote today. And we're back with the stories for this week. Larry, we've been talking about this one story since before we started this show tonight. Which one? The GPL one. Yes. A- and I, we, have, we all have questions. Yeah, so this is uh, my story number six related to uh, Ryan Dewhurst and the WP Scan licensing debacle that is currently underway. Um, Ryan Dewhurst is friend of the friend of the show. We've yes. had him on before. I um, met him in person. Yep, exactly. Random storm. Um, the uh, um, we've used WP Scan in a number of times. We've talked about it on the show mm-hmm. before. Um, and uh, up until very recently, WP Scan had a GPL license. Uh, and one of the things that is in this blog post is that Ryan's talking about, you know, one of the things that really drags us down from working on this project is, uh, and the volunteers and all the stuff, is that um, people take the tool and uh, then sell WP Scan. Now, according to the GPL, technically they can, but they have to give them submit source code back to the tree if they change anything so forth and so on and i don't pretend to understand any of these damn licensing stuff because well that's what the lawyers are for um the gpl does not disallow any use of the product for commercial purposes as in we can use this on a pen test and get paid for it but we technically can't go and sell it unless we release all the gpl code back to the public and say we do so this is the whole linksys thing that we had that Linksys used uh, uh, GPL code. They found out, uh, someone found out, they released all the stuff, and then bugs were found in, in the stuff they were using. So that's how we got third-party uh, firmware on a lot of the, the Linksys routers. Um, so they went through and they found one. Usually they just send a send a note and say, hey, please stop, stop doing that. Um uh, or we can, from the WP Scan and Ryan's perspective, we can uh, sell you a license for a non GPL version that you guys can pay us some money. And my understanding is probably not all that much. Uh, they have all decided not to pay and then stop using WP Scan. However, there's this one time that a um, company said. Um, that, uh, no, we're not going to pay for it, and we're going to continue to use it. So they changed the license to from the GPL license to a GPL with a clause that basically does just that. If you want to use it says you can't use it commercially. Right. If you do, well, you get a pass. Well, yeah, you can use it commercially, but if you want to resell it, you need to pass. He also says he hasn't received much in the way of contributions to the project. project. Right. Right. So, you know, it's funny. You were saying, Larry, that you don't really think much of it. I mean, I, I've got several pieces of software that I've written out there that, I, that I've that i honestly used the GPL on, and I haven't really thought too much about it other than whacking the license on and moving on, right? Um, but then you run into these kind of situations. and um, Where you have to whack the license off. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, I Josh's mean, it, pretty good at that, though. Yeah. Huh. Well, it's it's. Um, I'm just going to ignore that and keep talking. It's uh, <laughs> it's one of those things that uh, uh, what the work you did became um, one of much more intrinsic value, and suddenly that license is not adequate to really cover what you need. Right. Yep, I mean, yep. that's that's what I think I'm hearing. Yep. Um, yep. And um, I think. Um, I think we there's a lot of software authors. I know um, Carlos is one of them, very prolific. Uh, 
that you know we we tend not to think about it right we tend to be kind of a benevolent crew of people we like to kind of learn things and share that knowledge but uh eventually there is that inflection point where it's like wait that's worth real money and uh don't screw me (laughs) so typically go through uh, bsd BSD license for the code i don't have any problem with people sharing and using and just give back credit to me, uh, but when I want to be a bastard and I don't want my code to actually be used commercially, I actually do select GPL 3 or 2 when I have some code that I'm going like, oh, I know that some people are looking at this and they're going to try to put it in a product, and I don't want it used that way, I'm going to stick GPL 3 on it, and so I actually I, do it on purpose. I have a question I, for, I tend for, to go to for GPL3 Joff, as uh, Carlos, though. and Larry. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, all of us, myself included, have written software and, and made it freely available under some free kind as in, of like, free as in beer. Yeah, as some kind of license, whatever we chose. Why make the source code open in the first place? What's your like number one reason for doing that? I'll start with Joff. What's your okay, goal? That's a that's a great question. I I think the number one reason is because I would like to see um, the community, especially the security community. Um, learn and share that knowledge and and be able to take that tool and adapt it and and take it further uh, and and hopefully contribute back to it as well and it's funny actually the 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 tech segment I did last week I had um, somebody pick up on today and made a number of contributions and fork it and make commits back and and that's exactly what I like to see it's like I, I have an idea let's put it out there and Hi, let's John. You know, let's jo- you know have have something be extended and 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 okay. So hi, John. <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey, John. Yeah. We're having an interesting conversation that um, you and I have had for a while. He, I've, he's, I've, he's in the creepy raper van. Yeah, I've challenged the crew to uh, come up with their number one reason for releasing so- software as open source. Now, before I let you go, John, I want to turn over to Carlos because Carlos has a lot of uh, and, and, source. And I'm going after Carlos. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's okay. In, in I'm, I'm just right now. I'm doing the uh, Bruce Potter creepy crotch cam view. Um, Excellent. <laughs> Thanks for that. In, in, in my case, the medium actually kind of forces me in several places. Like I, I'm using Python. I'm using Ruby. I'm using PowerShell. Uh, I don't have any other option to actually put it that uh, that way unless I start kind of encrypting everything. Um, and the uh, and going through a bunch of hoops that just is going to make it more difficult. The other one is, I actually had a lot of people come to me and say, "Dude, I learned Bash scripting from your Metasploit install script. It was so useful. I learned a lot." Uh, so for the stuff I want to share, um, I have no problem with it being open source because that's what I want to do. I do have some tools that I've written that are not public, and there's. Mm-hmm closed source and Mm -hmm. I have them in my box and in my backups and uh, I do have a couple of people that actually uses them and they get copies of compiled code in C++. Others get compiled copies in .NET code that it's fairly trivial to reverse engineer if they want to, uh, but I don't give them the source code. And I kind of decide on what I want to share and what I don't want to share. And depending on, on that, I make my decisions in licensing and on what language I'm going to use. Yeah. Larry, what about you? So to, to this point, every piece of code that I've ever written and released has never had a specific license attached to it. But uh, I would argue free as in beer, uh, much like Mike Kershaw does with Kismet, as in I'm giving this to the community. Please go forth and enjoy it, give back, uh, learn from it. And if you want to make a living off of this stuff by reselling it, go ahead. Just you know, make sure you credit me where where credit is due and go ahead, sell it. I, I, I don't care. Use it for commercial purposes. Use it for um, print it out and use it as toilet paper. You know, do whatever the heck you want with it because I wrote it for me to learn and to solve a problem that I had and hopefully it solves a problem for someone else. So uh, no, that I'll be in the same point as Carlos that there's stuff that I've written that will we'll probably never see the light of day aside from a few folks that I really trust um, and mostly because it's crap <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, there's going to be stuff that's written for me and we'll never see the light of day and uh, but Larry here's the here's the problem I have with that 
is, you know, we have a lot of people in the community that are like, this is just a crap script that I wrote and I don't want to share it with the community. And we seem to have this, this, this problem that unless we're releasing something groundbreaking, um, we don't think it's worthy to be released to the community. And I, I kind of rile against that. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. And, well, and, and in I my case, just go to my GitHub and you'll find. <laughs> 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 uh, well, okay. Well, let's use Carlos as an example. Carlos, if we go back like five, six years ago, when, when when like I first met you, were you developing and coding at the level that you are today, or would a lot of the code that you had back then be kind of embarrassment today? No. Uh, uh, on Ruby, no. On uh, on Batch, it's kind of like the same. <laughs> but if you right now, if you go into my GitHub, you'll find very crappy stuff that uh, that I just whipped up together in a couple of minutes and says, oh, "Okay, let me just put it o- o- over there in GitHub. Somebody will find it. Somebody will find it useful." Uh, it all depends on my mood. If it is something that I want to make a full project out of, yeah, I'll spend time to make sure it's all fine and dandy, and I follow best practices. But if you go, let's say, to my Interpreter dash scripts uh, repo where any module, any script that I think of that I don't, uh, even stupid ones I'll upload there and I'll put them out there to share with people. And some people actually just take s- snippets out of those and use them for other stuff. Interesting. Yep. Well, I, I take John's point, and I'm not just trying to kiss up here, but um, that. <laughs> yes, you are. Uh, yeah, I <laughs> listen to Carlos. But um, no, the, the the thing last week is a good example for me. Um, you know, it, it really simple thing using regional internet registry data. I was like, you know, I, I should probably go ahead and release this just because it it, it is simplistic to me um, and it is fairly um, usable. And I might have taken that approach that, that John was saying that, oh, maybe, you know, this that's not worth it. It's not a big big endeavor. It's just not worth the trouble. But then I started to realize the utility of it. I was like, I, this is actually kind of usable stuff. Um, so why not put it out there? Um, I, and I, I think that's a that's a good approach. Let's just put it out there. Even if it's not the greatest thing in the world, um, somebody's going to take interest in it, uh, maybe push it further, maybe contribute ideas. I hope that's what happens. That That's that's definitely the way I like to think about it. So to bring this back to the, the WP scan mm. um stuff so ryan went and changed the license and people are saying you can't do this with the gpl and well all right maybe you can't do this with the gpl license but now that he's changed it call it something else not the the ryan dewhurst gpl license and you know what you it's your stuff like i I would argue that you can license it however the hell you want it want to i would Uh, argue does that license only apply to all code written thereafter and not previous ver- that's works. A, that's a that good code. question. That's a good question. So to that, think, uh, yeah. to that that point, what Pick the company your license wisely? Yeah, that that company that that Ryan went to that said, yeah, no, we're not going to change anything. Um, they went or their company out of Canada, and they said, yeah, you know what? They have a blog post entitled, uh, "What was it? Gun to our head." I think their response was maybe a little bit uh, heavy-handed. Robbed at gunpoint was the title of their blog post um, in that uh, they were publicly accused of breaching a non-commercial clause of a GPL licensed software, namely WP Scan. They say that they don't include any of their code, um, all this stuff. However... um, that they just call it and well that they were they were blackmailed or forced into having to pay for a commercial license for for this tool um by ryan and that uh they weren't going to pay it they're going to stop using wp scan um i i think they were maybe a little heavy-handed in their response because quite honestly all they really needed to do was from my understanding if they made any changes to the code to publish those code, that code, and acknowledge the fact that they were they were using it. From my understanding of the the version of the GPL that was used, and that Ryan would have been happy with that, um, which they say in their blog post. Oh yeah, that was something that they were gonna do, but never did. And now that yeah, we've been that, sound, that makes them sound really shady. Yeah, and now that we've been f- hit with this yeah. request for a commercial license that we need to pay for, 
yeah, to, to, to screw you guys, we're going to go back to the version right before that license was uh, created and create a fork. And we're going to call it a new tool and we're going to update it. And right now it doesn't work because uh, we have to go change the license and we have to go change all the references to WP scan. But we're a small shop and we haven't gotten to it yet. And please do abuse our work and use it for whatever the hell you want. So they're taking GPL software, they're forking it, and, and to me it sounds like they are changing the license to something else. To me, that doesn't sound right. to me that doesn't sound right. Yeah. Something that's licensed to GPL3 before Ryan made the changes to update the commercial license stuff in relation to some of this. Go back one that's still GPL'd, and now we're going to take that, remove the GPL license, and give it away for free. No, you can't remove a license but from the software. But to me that's what it sounds like they're doing. Yeah. Right. Or they're putting GPL3 and choosing to ignore any of the non-commercial stuff. Yeah, they're b they're being dicks. <laughs> I, Pretty much. Yeah, Carlos, I, I, Carlos went straight to the point. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't think we need to beat, beat around the bush, but we've seen this with a handful of projects in the past where they all of a sudden decide, hey, we could make money at this, and they decide to try to try to try to change it around and and not be upfront about it. And hey, I'm gonna. You know, let, let's let's throw Tenable on the table. Um, at the very least, whenever Nessus went from open source and went commercial, they clearly explained why they were doing it. They clearly explained how they were going to do it. They clearly laid out all of the reasons. And there were people that disagreed with Renault and the people at Tenable, but at least you understood where their motivations were, and they weren't trying to be shady about how they went about doing it. Mm -hmm. It was all very much upfront. It was all very clearly articulated and explained as to why they were doing it, and you know all the all the philosophical reasons behind it. And I'm almost I, I prefer that model. I may, may may have disagreed with it at the time, but at least they were honest about it, trying to back things up, yep. fork it, and try to get around it. I, I agree with Carlos. That's 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 a dick move. Yeah. Now take this from a man who now has a neck beard. <laughs> what? No, go go back to John. Shot, John, t tilt your head back a little bit. See the man who has a neck beard. He does have a neck beard. I can't see him. I I, I guess hey, I'm not. Me neither. Hey now, hey now, hey now. My wife likes it. She says it tickles her thighs. So no complaining. <laughs> hey, my wife says the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> you your you're, wait wait, Larry. Your wife says that John's beard tickles her thighs. Yes. What? Yes. Well, and, and it's weird. My wife wanted me to grow a beard because of Larry's beard. It's just strange. <laughs> oh, okay. That freaks me out. <laughs> Actually, to be honest, if yeah, that that's that's the, pretty scary all the way around. Yeah, this podcast is nothing but an excuse to do wife swapping. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we, well, how did we even? <laughs> Good lord! Wait, wow. Paul, you how didn't did tell Shannon there? she was next? <laughs> Good lord! <laughs> how did we get? To these places. It's I'm sorry, fine. Paul. I'm See, sorry. you invited me on the show. You're like, you know, you do the webcast stuff, but you should really come on the show more. Um, it classes the place up a bit, and here we are. Yeah, and here we he, are. Yeah. See, he used to class the place up. A okay, bit. let's go someplace different. Hacking cars for insurance dongles? Through uh, through insurance dongles. Oh, okay. I was confused oh, by the title. Oh, I, I, okay, yeah, i got to change that. Through insurance dongles. I think he got stuck on the word dongle. Yeah, dong. <laughs> 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 well, I'm somewhat intrigued with the insurance dongles that plug into cars. Yeah, I, so there, there's. I'm greatly troubled by that. That by plugging something into the um, ODB port, ODB two, two port, port that yep. the insurance company can get reports on how I'm driving. Mm -hmm. That makes me. That's very troubling. Yeah. In so terms of privacy, that's probably like at the <clears throat> tops of my list. Yes. A bad thing but, for me. But you, Especially for me with the way I right. drive. Right. So now neither one of these programs that they reference here are mandatory. They are completely opt-in. Opt in. So, yes. Um, the first one is they're, they're both devices that you plug into the, the ODB2 port, which is a bidirectional interface. In this case, it's doing reading and reporting over a cell technology back to some head unit that determines that, oh, you always drive on the speed limit, so we'll reduce your insurance rates and stuff. Um, the first how do they, one. How do they know zooming. what the speed limit is at the time they're taking the measurements? Uh, it's reported as part of the CAN bus messages. Yeah, but how does the car know what the speed limit is I, on the I, CAN I bus? Think, 
I, a GPS see, I don't, uh, sends I, it, doesn't What Paul's getting at is he, the car doesn't know what speed limit or speed zone it's in. Yes. But if you see a car that's going like 90 miles an hour, it's fairly safe to assume that you broke the speed limit. Yes. And I also think they can look at the acceleration, see how quickly the car is accelerated and decelerated as well. Yes. I don't think it's just looking at yep. uh, speed yeah, limits. Yeah, because they don't know what the speed limit is. Well, they could because if they are using cell phone that they could do tower triangulation to determine if, uh, approximate GPS If they location. can transit location and then have a database that knows what the speed limit is right. in that location, right. that'd be kind yeah, of impressive. I was going to say, yep. if they got GPS in there. Keep keep going, Larry. Yep. Sorry. So uh, the first one was the, the Zuby um, uh, GPRS modem to connect back to the Zuby cloud. Um, found out that there was also a diagnostic ODB2 connector inbound uh a serial port which they were able to communicate with and they were given with an at command interface with no authentication um they the device off but open does open firmware updates every time it checks in so they set up a rogue cell tower to perform man in the middle attacks and then they pushed it um rogue firmware updates and all the firmware updates are unsigned so now, once that happens, you could potentially open backdoors and allow communication inbound to the CAN bus device. So what I was thinking on this story, Larry, was that if I can hack into people's dongles that are connected to their cars and reporting to their insurance companies, that yes. I could remotely tell your car dongle and influence the reporting, which means I could tell that you never drive slow, accelerate really fast, and all the bad things that would increase your insurance. Yes. Other than wreaking yep. havoc, there's really no... There's well, no. I, I don't profit from that other than I get a good laugh uh, out of when your insurance goes up. You could make well, my well, insurance go up. Or not only could you have the, modify the device to have it send false updates, you could now modify the device. So it's connecting over the cell network. Mm-hmm by some communications method. If you can now enable backdoor, say IP enable that, if it's not already IP enabled, connect, create a fake, ce- fake cell tower, it connects to a fake cell tower, you can then connect to it and issue commands over the ODB2, OBD2 port with your custom firmware and push, hey, we just depressed so the you, accelerator. You think well, that the communication to that device is two-way? You think yes. I can communicate yes. to so that it, device yep. and a, have it update one of the ECUs in your car? Not update one of the ECUs, just inject messages. Inject messages yeah, on and, the campus. And, and Paul, yes. I have a great example for that. Uh, at InfoSec Tactico, my uh, my other podcast in Spanish, I interviewed uh, Jaime Restrepo. He's also known as Dragon Jar. Uh, he was doing a study in, in Colombia. He actually bought a new car, a Chrysler model that is sold in Latin America. And he was looking at it and it has what they call Chrysler Star that is kind of like on star Mm -hmm. where you can actually connect to the vehicle. You can get information about your vehicle. And all of a sudden he was looking at the web page and going like, wow, this web page really looks very crappy. And he changed the ID on his vehicle. And now he was seeing information from another vehicle. (laughs) He was like, wow, this is scary. And he started, and he went like, let me do a bit of research here. Uh, Since laws over there are more lax than in the U S they actually set up a fake, cell phone tower, um, GSM tower, they were able to kind of intercept the different messages that the car was sending back to Chrysler for the service. They were looking at the, uh, that there were a couple of commands uh, that actually had options. They started playing with the options and they start seeing, oh, we can turn on and turn off the car. Huh. Mm-hmm. We can lock the doors and unlock the doors. Mm-hmm. Oh, look, GPS information and where the car is, latitude and longitude. Unlock. And then, yeah, and he and he was and due to the nature of where he lives and some other stuff, he was saying this is perfect for kidnapping. Mm-hmm. We can just identify the bin number and all the information of the car that we want. We start washing that car. We look at patterns in the GPS data, where they go, where they don't go, and this is going to be an, our ambush point. So what do we do? We send a signal, turn off the car, lock the doors. Now we have that person where we yep. want it. Or we want to steal the car. We were watching that car. Specific, and, and he has been trying to report it to Chrysler for over a year. And Chrysler just keeps ignoring him completely. Nice. So, and he so can actually do all this stuff to the cars. Two things. One, how the hell do we jump straight to kidnapping people? Um, that, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, I, one I, of I, the possibilities I, that could yeah, be it's uh, like, hey, let's, let's go right abuse. To kidnappings. 
Um, the other thing is, you know, it's funny. People talk about that that tracking of, of where you're at. And, Joff, I'll talk a little bit about uh, – I can't remember the name of the company. We just got access to um, kind of a background investigation software. Dave Kennedy recommended it. And it, it's funny. Whenever people start freaking out about being able to track where their car is, it's already being done. So, you know, every time you go through a red light, they're taking pictures. Every time you park at a yep. parking garage, they're taking pictures. And the thing that we found out relatively recently is pretty much all that information is for sale. And you can hook into databases and I can get like Paul's license plate number. And I can find all the places that his car has been as long as the city and as long as the parking garages are selling that information. And that costs yep. about a dollar. Um, so it, it's funny, people freak out about this stuff, but the reality is it's already out there and it's actually very dirt cheap to get that information. John, are you, is someone, are you in a moving car? Well, it's not moving. Are you, <laughs> is someone else driving? I see lights like going by overhead. No. Those are cars driving. driving by. I am sorry, but podcasting and driving at the same time. No, no, no. I'm implying that you're in the car and someone else is driving while you're podcasting. No, no. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting like outside of the, the oh, martial are, arts thingy. Those are that, other cars driving by behind you. Yes, those are, those are other you. cars driving by me. I, and it got <laughs> very dark at John's house or John's I got, place. I can turn quickly. on some lights. You know, Maybe that'll help. Some, Paul's always bitching about lighting of things. Make sure we've got backlit or whatever. Oh, yeah. And the car interior lighting is just splendid for video, John. <laughs> what's what's wrong with this? That's sexy. That's just creepy. It's sexy. <laughs> see, so, what I think is creepy, Larry I, I thinks is sexy. Him, if that tells see, you let's, anything let's about go. our personas here on Security Let's just take this conversation straight to kidnappings. Uh, welcome to the Hannah Montana <laughs> bus boys and girls but uh, so uh, john, yeah. Can, yeah, john uh, can you do that shot again where you get really close and we go no. back to his camera see this is what mike perez wakes up to every morning <laughs> <laughs> especially at a sans yeah. conference larry tell us yeah, about uh, key, uh, tell us about key sweeper this is uh sammy kakmar yeah yeah the sammy worm i will always forever remember. think of him as the sammy, sammy worm guy but yep. sammy is a very talented researcher he is, he is. and just uh published some research on sniffing wireless rf keyboards with arduino yes yeah, so it's n it's not new work it is an adaptation of some work done by uh max moser and mm -hmm. some other folks uh, Travis Goodspeed mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, I remember and, all that research. And ported largely to Arduino with some additional features. And to me, this is why um, it's a little open bit source. I, and I think the value of open source. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Mm -hmm. um, combining some of uh, Max Moser's stuff as well as some of Travis's stuff um, and putting it on a different platform on Arduino to make it accessible with a, an inexpensive radio that I talked about at the the Wi-Fi Village at DEF CON this year um, to be able to sniff uh, Microsoft keyboards. That's really not the new part. The new part is the ability to take the hardware that Sammy used and have it integrate with a 2G module for Arduino sold by Adafruit so that you can take the keystrokes as sniffed remotely and log them over GSM, over 2G, to a server that we control on the internet with code running on a web server and it logs all the keystrokes remotely. Um, there's also an option to be able to use a flash chip that he doesn't have documented but should be fairly easy to recreate. Um, so that if you don't want to do it over 2G, you can do it local and have to retrieve it. Um, and it also spits out all of the keystrokes and all the command stuff over the built-in serial port. So if you want to just use it as a local sniffer, you can do that too. Um, the, uh, the thing that I thought was neat about the, the GSM and the code to collect the keystrokes remotely uh, was the form factor. It is in a USB charging wall port, and it still charges... USB devices. And <laughs> so, sniffs keyboards. I love yeah, it. Yeah, and sniffs keyboards. Yeah, so you I, go plug, I, the, I, you I go plug this in the wall and you plug in something to charge it with. And he's got a picture here of um, the, the Spaceman USB lamp plugged in. So it still works for USB and sniffs keystrokes. Well, and Larry, you ought to mention as well that uh, he actually did put a lithium uh, ion battery in there. Yes. And if you unplug it from the wall, it continues to function for as long as the battery's charged and when you plug it back it. in it, it continues to charge the battery and act as a USB charger so he actually managed to locate a, um, a wall wart 
that um, unlike most, if you look at most of the Warwarts, they're sealed units. But he mm -hmm. found one that actually that had a screw. screw on it. So he could actually pop, pop the shell off of it and install all the hardware. I thought it was a great, great little adventure. Ab absolutely. The other one, too, that he's got, too, is that you? if you have multiple of these... You don't have to have the G GSM module in multiple of them. You can have it just be in one, and they will aggregate all of the keystrokes back over those Nordic 2.4 gigahertz radios to the one that has the GSM modem in it. So you yeah, he had a he had a back channel of some yeah, sort, right? Like back, tra back tracer, yeah. Back tracer, yeah. Neat gadget. Um, I was wondering if we could um, we could get any eight to eleven in there uh, as a peer. To peer kind of communication option as well the, uh, uh, as an alternative to GSM. Yeah, the the um, to eleven stuff is going to draw some pretty significant power, so battery wouldn't be an option for us. And the yeah. modules are significantly larger, so that's that's the only that's the that's the problems. downside yeah. there. Okay. So of course I had to go and build one of these things. Uh, <laughs> nice. So I, I <laughs> did I, you build one? Yeah, of course. Nice. <laughs> um, I built it. Uh, I finished it last night. Um, and it's only logging over serial currently. I don't want to buy one of the GSM modules because the GSM modules are a little bit expensive, and they're only 2G. So you have to get a SIM card that works with, I think it was Boost or something of the like. I don't know if I have any need Boost for that. Boost Mobile? Boost Mobile or something like that. It, it, he's got a list of providers in here that do 2G. Yeah, it's 2G, not 3G. Um so I don't know if I wanted to go that because they're not largely supported by many of the carriers anymore. So limited use for me to use that mm. somewhere else. Um, but what I want to do is I do want to do the SPI serial flash chip. Um, they're about a dollar ninety five from Adafruit, mm -hmm. and I haven't placed an order for one yet because I don't want to place a two dollar order at Adafruit. Uh, I want to <laughs> place a larger order, and that's not hard to do. Um, he also doesn't have it documented on how to write that stuff to the flash chip. It's all in the code that it does it, but it doesn't tell you how to wire it up and any of that stuff. So um, I'm going to do that and get it figured out. So, so uh, I'm sorry, Larry. I, I think I just m missed your point that the the flash chip. The idea is that you're just logging. Yeah, logging, the data. logging local as opposed to over GSM. And right. The, and so, the flash, so, and the so, flash chip is one meg, so that's a lot of keystrokes. And how do you get the data off it's after you logged? It's, it's literally a serial. Stroking? You have to go back and retrieve it, and then you have to have an interface to be able to get it off. And I don't know that the interface exists currently. Okay, so that's a, that's a TBD, but yep. um, that would be neat though um, to be able to plant the device, come back later. Yep. Now, now, me for uh, a pen yep. test, I'm going to largely do it while I'm there on site, and I can have access to the device, plug it into my laptop, and access it over serial. You like right. keystroking when you're on site? I do. I mm. do. Usually, sure. I save that for when I get to the hotel, though. <laughs> 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 no, I think it's a it's a neat project, and and um, uh, unfortunately, shame on those who, uh, to some extent, who produce these devices that that a simple XOR. Uh, can quote unquote yep. decrypt. <laughs> of course, so I, I can't tell if mine's actually working because I don't have one of the Microsoft keyboards. I have one of the Logitech ones that is very similar, uses the same chipset, but the encoding for the keystrokes is not quite the same, so it doesn't detect it. So you can bet you know what I'm going to go out and buy one of this weekend. Yeah, I think you just have to, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Very nice. So, Paul, you're looking at some more stuff? I just read the article about uh, cracking litter box DRM. <laughs> and I had heard about these litter boxes that, and I didn't know this exactly how they worked. So, it's an auto cleaning litter box, which I means know. it <laughs> scoops up the plastic granules. And that, and so, it's not kitty litter, it's actually plastic granules yeah. and washes them and then replaces them. Yeah, washes them in a specialized solution. So, you still have to clean. The, you have to get the poop out of the litter box. Oh no! It takes that out. So it it scoops up it's, the it scoops up and basically oh. takes the, the the number ones the, and number twos. It yep. scoops them all up and it puts them in a little container and then yeah. the beads that come with it get washed and the beads yep. go back. And then oh, so then you just remove the number the ones and number twos. Yes, you uh, yeah. yes. I gotcha. I gotcha. I've got a much simpler solution. It you just have to. 
Yeah, get a dog. <laughs> yeah, because then they eat all the Tootsie Rolls out of the litter box. Right. Yes! They, they totally do. <laughs> well, I found that out last week. My dog came in and cleaned the litter box for me, and I was like, ooh, wait. wait no, this, this is, is great. great. <laughs> and then the dog comes over and gives you a big lick on the face. And, and then the and dog like, yaks on the carpet is really, yeah. really what happens, and it's just more mess to clean up. Yeah, I, I, I oh, but so the point of the story was uh, <laughs> that the cartridges that you have to replace. Yep. What, are those the ones that have the number ones and number twos in it? No, these are the cleaning solution. The cleaning solution cartridges are RFID tags, so you can only use their cleaning solution, similar to yes. the Keurig. Yes. You can only use their Keurigs. Yes. But and you can open – they released open source firmware for the litter box. I love that I can say there's open source firmware available for your litter box. That makes me excited for some reason. Yes. Um, and uh, Cartridge Genius is a drop-in replacement – and then we'll let you what, put any kind of cartridge in uh, there. So you have so the part of the thing for the cartridge stuff is it does management of f- open uh, for uh, fullness. How yes. much solution is in the cartridge? Yep. You can refill the cartridges on your own, uh, like the printer thing. Uh, yes. But the re- thing doesn't reset, so they change it so that you can reset the full value, so you don't have to keep replacing cartridges. You can refill them with solution. On what your kind own. of cleaning solution? I don't. I don't know. I don't have one of the boxes. So, oh, I thought so you, you you would have one of these, Larry, because you so still so have quite a few cats at I, home, right? We do, yes. We, we, we have, look we into have one of those, and then live on the air, you can update the firmware of your litter box. That would be awesome. Oh, well, I would bring a cat to make a number one or two. I was just saying, that is this, have to is get this some putting, putting your job into the sort of shitty category? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a really shitty job. It is. Shitty job. And should we now go, you know commune with like micro and maybe get our jobs onto dirty jobs and get on tv and stuff dirty jobs does not exist anymore well it, it used to it got canceled oh yeah. no one cared I, yeah. no one cared <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so that i thought it, i just thought it was funny that two weeks ago we talked about the curie coffee drm and now this week it's kitty litter drm oh joff let's continue on the uh cool toys kind of thing <laughs> <laughs> There's a hardware hackers build USB cable that can attack. Yes. Yeah, I thought that was really cool. I Tell just, me about this. This looks cool. So um, this is a, uh, a thing called a cotton mouth uh, <laughs> USB cable. <laughs> yeah, jo- jo- Joff, the other toy that I thought you meant uh, could help with that cotton mouth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's one of the one of the NSA's. Um, um, you know uh, gadgets that, that that they had in the uh, ant catalog, uh, but but it, the original was a twenty thousand uh, dollar unit, and uh, somebody's worked on um, uh, a, a more of a twenty dollar version where the uh, electronics in the cotton mouth uh, are able to to do a, a wireless bridge uh, and also load exploits uh, onto a target PC by plugging in the cable and the clamshell on the cable. Literally, just looks like a USB cable, right? I mean, the 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 circuit board is built into the clamshell on the connector, which I thought was <laughs> really freaking cool. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, I think uh, not surprisingly, Michael Osman is involved. Um, and my, Mike, I Mike Osman, Dominic Spill, and Jared Boone. Yep, yep. Um, and I, I just thought that was, I don't know, one of those. Right along the lines of what you were saying about the uh, the, the the USB dongle that uh, sniffs keystrokes, this is another one of those that I thought, wow, what a great gadget to have in the toy box, you know, um, something that you could load up some uh, firmware on and just, uh, I mean, sorry, some uh, some malware on and uh, slot it into the USB slot and uh, and and hand it to somebody saying, you mind um, charging my phone? I'm I'm a little low on battery here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah yeah good stuff yep so they cre- they created a, a product for USB 3.0 called Daisho Daisho and the one that they talked about here in the article is called uh Turnip School Turnip School that's right Turnip yeah. School and uh they cost they you saying $20,000 um they got theirs down to yeah I want to say the $20, 20 so yeah. A custom layer for a custom four layer PC board that costs a dollar fifty. USB hub on a chip at four dollars. TI microcontroller with built-in RF transceiver at four dollars. Solder, three D printed injection mold and plastic cover. Yeah. As Mike Osman said, I soldered it myself. Very nice. So yeah. So it costs you know twenty dollars, including case. Yeah. And and now I didn't get too in deep here to see what you could do with. 
with what you had there in terms of malware delivery, but I'm sure there's a, uh, you know, it, it probably simulates a file system and um, yeah, well, so it can do all sorts of stuff because uh, the at least the one on the uh, that I'm seeing here on the USB 3.0 has uh, an FPGA, which you just tell it what you want it to do. Oh, nice! Yeah. So uh, cool gadget. Lots of cool gadgets coming out. Yes. Yeah. Between that, between the between the uh, the Thunderstrike stuff, which uh, ooh, yeah. anyway, that one's kind of scary yep. uh, in a lot of ways. And uh, and then we have uh, our great little USB charger gadgets. I mean, there's lots lots of great stuff going on. Yep. Carlos uh, has got some stuff in here. Uh, Carlos, I want to hear about your password reuse fuels Starwood fraud spike. This is from Krebs on security. Carlos, I think you're muted. I see your lips moving. How about now? Yes. Ah. <laughs> okay, that's that cool. was really funny. Uh, that's that's, that's how sexy moving, you're. But I can't hear what you're saying. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> is that a lyric to a song? <laughs> uh, yeah, so that is Pink so, Floyd. Very good. So the loyalty service uh, from Starwood uh, for their preferred guests got hacked. And what happened was that we start, they, uh, there was a uptake in frauds happening. And when they started kind of looking into it, one of the things they noticed was that all the users were kind of using the same password for other stuff. I recently read uh, Krebs' book on Spam Nation, which is a great book. Highly recommend it. Um, and one of the things he mentions was that People uh, or hackers or all of these different organizations, when they get in, one of the things they like to first try to go after is your uh, password for your email because nowadays everything's tied to your email. You want to reset an account for any of your services, it goes to your email. You want to use kind of a login for a system, it goes to your email. So here it's just kind of like reminding everybody like, hey, keep different passwords for different systems, use a password manager. Um, I've, I've heard from so many family members that just put their, the same password everywhere in there. In the forum of uh, My Little Pony lovers or whatever, and uh, you know, Carlos has girls. they're not that secure, and they get hacked, and the password gets reused. My yep. Little Pony. <laughs> Shut up. See, my, my daughter's 15. She's way beyond My Little Pony. <laughs> oh, dude, I have a one-year-old and a nine-year-old. The, the other story I have is... Uh, <laughs> oh, great sounds, Larry. Uh, it's the cord coming out of the bourbon. Yeah, the, uh, the other one is that we started seeing now uh, uh, Adobe released today a patch for us here today. Uh, so far, it has only been seen uh, in the Angler's exploit kit. It has been abusing several mixtures of Internet Explorer and Microsoft Windows, so they have kind of a list of if the target is Windows XP with this version of IE launch, th this is the offsets that you're going to be using. This is where you're uh, how you're going to execute. Oh, no, you're running Windows 8.1, and this is the version of IE that you're going to be running. Uh, this is the payload that you're going to deliver to the target. Um, Adobe also patched the versions for Mac and Linux. This has been kind of used. I, I'm, I'm still kind of debating why do people put Flash on their boxes. I recently rebuilt uh, my MacBook uh, and a couple of Windows boxes here at home. And so far, I have not needed Flash for anything. Um, so that's one for people to kind of be aware of and to get patching and the other one the story I had there was for Oracle. Oracle decided to kind of release quite a big number of patches for um, 160 holes, 93 of those remotely exploitable. For and most of it is for Java. Java is on the uh, on the uptake again now in 2015. Wow, you think 2015 is going to be another big Java year? Could be. Well, you know? I thought Java prompted the user and said. You're going to do bad things. This thing isn't trusted, so you have to click here first. Does that not matter? Did that just kind of slow it down a little? <laughs> slow it down a bit. Yeah. but it was, People it, still uh, people are kind of custom. Click. Okay, okay, okay. I'm getting this for my internal CRM application every time because the admin never signed and never did a, a policy of deploying the uh, signature files or signature list to all of the clients so they know that they need to trust the signatures for this Java applet. 
and they're accustomed to seeing that warning, just clicking OK to get to their application. They go into the internet or they click a link and they see the same pop up. The muscle memory comes in and they click OK again on it. Yeah, they get trained, right? I mean, it's the same issue as the, you know, the, the, the SSL certificate pop ups, the, the same issue as UAC. It's, it's mm. all the same, right? Everybody my my biggest worry is that, yeah. and this comes from patching right now. I have a blog post that I've been debating if I'm going to publish it or not, and it's about users and admins losing trust in Microsoft. For the last six months, they have kind of screwed up every patch Tuesday and have to recall patches and reissue patches. Many of them cause applications to crash constantly. Others cause blue screen. Others made the system completely unusable. And um, and as I've been in several mail lists, I've seen people go like, no, now we wait 30 days. Now we wait 60 days before applying patches. Now we, uh, and the most aggressive ones are going like, yeah, we wait 14 days or two weeks before we apply patches. And it just, that just scares me, that lack of trust now on that, uh, on that patch system. And recently it was, uh, this last one actually went very well. But before that, they really... We're having a very bad track record. And now when I see Oracle just come in and all of a sudden they have um, so many freaking products affected by by one single release, how do sysadmins actually take the time to actually test all of this shit? Do, we do have MySQL, we have VirtualBox, we have Solaris, we have Java, we have PeopleSoft, we have WebLogic, we have so many freaking products all at once, getting a bunch of patches and many of them remote code execution bugs. Do, do you think the, um, the 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 Microsoft example? Do you think that uh, with the Patch Tuesday cycle going well in the past, you think people got complacent? I mean, is this perhaps? Yeah, they, uh, they start trusting it blindly and just applying the patches without having right, due right. process of testing them. And so my, so my point is, is, is this perhaps um, a, a gift almost or maybe a good thing in that it's forcing people to do some regression testing and on, on the patches that are applying um, and, and putting a little bit more thought in it into it uh, rather than just becoming complacent? Um, it is a so good thing when you have Good thing and a bad thing that. at the same time, I suppose, because the time yeah, it, window is shortened. Uh, it becomes longer, right? It all depends on the organization and their sysadmins and how much backing they have from management on this. Yeah. Um, because a lot of people are going, I, um, I've started engaging with some of the people in the patch management mailing list and in other mailing lists, and they, and they were going like, oh, but we don't have the budget for this. And go like, can't you select a couple of users from the different groups where you already have software inventory and you know that this per, this small group of subset of your users actually kind of cover most of your use cases and have them use that and you can actually deploy to them first wait two three days and then deploy if they don't inform back to you any problems or are there any issues and they're and kind of bringing ideas to them but i was always hearing excuses on the majority of the people I, I was talking to, like, oh, you security people, you think that you need to deploy your patches so fast. I'm going like, well, dude, let me put it this way. Many times this company took 90 days, 120 days, probably a year to patch this. And this is something that was out there in the public. Probably a researcher told them. Many times you look at these advisories and some of the holes were actually reported by three or four researchers. So more than likely... The bad guy already found it, and many times it took them a month or two months, and it was being exploited in the wild in target attacks, and probably it's already out there being exploited. So you're already behind the eight ball. Yeah. And just Look, the, the, the part that concerns me is actually when you overlay that issue of, of patch quality challenges, or maybe not patch quality, they may be two stronger words, but, but, but you know, the, the challenges in complexity I guess with with in today's patching as well as the current fight that is ongoing between Google and Microsoft where Google is just flat out saying look 90 days you're that's it we're we're putting it out in public so so you know Google's policy is shortening that window um, yeah. immediately because they're not you know they they're just just cutting them off right at that 90 days 
combined yep. with that issue of of um, having to do some regression testing, so so the so the window of opportunity for exploitation is getting bigger because of that combination, I believe. Yeah, um, and also the way I see it with Google and Microsoft, they just uh, I see them like kids in preschool kind of arguing with one another. Um, in, in, the, in the case of Google, Microsoft came and says, hey, guys, next week we're releasing the patches. Can you guys wait a couple of days? No, we won't. Here's the, here's the exploit. Let me make it public. Oh, and by the way, here's the proof of concept code. And like That was very not professional, in my personal opinion. Uh, not that of my employer and not that of uh, Paul of Security Weekly, but I found it to be oh, very we almost, we almost immature. Had yeah, and um, I and think in the it's case quite, of Microsoft, many times I get well. pissed at them because they simply ignore a, a bunch of stuff and go like, no, 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 this is not a big issue, and then it turns out to be one. But in the case of that, our, that specific argument between Google and Microsoft, I won't like that. Google really didn't do something uh, that I was expected, expecting from them. Now, in the case of, of Google specifically, um, uh, my sense is and, and that they're applying that same policy to everybody. It's not just uh, directed at uh, Microsoft. It's just that Microsoft turns out to be the one that gets illustrated more often than not. Am I, am I wrong? Yeah, it, it is. And what worries me is the inflexibility. Like, yeah. Could they have waited a couple of days? Why did they have to release the proof of concept code so fast? Yeah, right. I mean, the inflexibility of just saying 90 days, that's it. Boom. It's out there. It's on the street. Um, no yep. negotiations. Um, and on the other hand, Microsoft has have behaved that same way with researchers. In fact, a, a many years ago, Microsoft just sent out lawyers after you if they wanted to keep you quiet. We've yeah. seen it in different conferences and stuff. Yeah, it's a, that's a tough one. I I have mixed feelings. Um, I mean, part of it puts pressure on and 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 brings people to the table to deliver, um, but part of it is also irresponsible. Spe you know, especially considering the uh, the vast majority of users that are affected and the and the the window of exploitation widening like that. It's it's a, it's a real challenge. Yeah, what worries me is that all of this stuff with patch management kind of coincided with the changes that happen inside of Microsoft. With Nadella and them being faster than before and being more agile and kind of uh, all of the layoffs. And that actually kind of scared me. Like, is this the new Microsoft? Is this what you're now going to expect? A kind of a downgrade on the patch, uh, on the patches, on the QA, on the testing. And that had me worried for a while. I've been talking with Jack and Jack felt the same way. Um, this last one actually went very well, but the number of patches was very small, um, and in, if, even though for some cases they actually screwed up the security one that Google reported, if you actually wanted to create a new account to the box, you actually had issues. So they're reissuing that patch in the near future, but it wasn't that severe the problem. Yeah, I'm glad you guys covered some of the patches coming out because yes. I wasn't paying attention. So thank you guys for that. With that, we're going to take a short break, come <laughs> back and wrap up the show. So don't go anywhere. Stay tuned for the... Win a free Hack Naked t-shirt contest. You're going to answer a question correctly on this show. This is open up to live viewers. So if you're watching live, stay tuned. We'll be right back. And we're back. Does anyone have a question? Uh, Chris, you don't have a question? Someone come up with a question. Come I got on. one. Yes. It's a dual part question. Something from the show. Did we talk about what we were drinking tonight? No. No. Okay, so we can't answer that question. Uh, what is the specific brand and model number of the chipset in the Microsoft keyboards illustrated with the key sweeper? Good question, Larry. Mm -hmm. say That's that an again. excellent question. Say that again What for is the manufacturer and model number of the radio used in Microsoft keyboards and the key sweeper? Email the answer to that question to psw at securityweekly.com. 
Um, are we doing first person to answer, Chris, or are we choosing? First correct person. We're choosing. Email the correct answer. We will choose a winner. Now, you can't win every week. Once you've won, there's a three-month blackout period. Yeah, give so someone else a chance, right? How many, yeah, how many t-shirts do, really do you need? How many t-shirts do you need? Don't, only, don't you yeah. have a closet full of black t-shirts That's already? Right. So you got three months blackout period. PSW at SecurityWeekly.com. Thanks, everyone. Larry, take us out. Over and out. Bourbon. <laughs>